Good evening, everybody. It's uh, 630. We're just waiting for a couple of more minutes. Um, we've had uh, over um, uh, over uh, 100 people sign up for this. And so there's folks just uh, entering the room here now. And so we'll wait another minute or two, admit the rest of the folks, and then we'll commence. Um, I'm going to get started. Uh, can you uh, continue to admit folks as we're getting started here? I'm doing that now. Great. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Pat Phillips. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Green Mountain Audubon Society, which is a chapter of Audubon, Vermont, uh, which covers Franklin, Grand Isle, and Chittenden counties. Um, if you happen to receive Audubon magazine or live in one of those counties, you're most likely to be a member of Green Mountain Audubon, and for that, we thank you. If you're interested in joining, uh, simply just go to our website, greenmountainaudubon.org, and uh, there's a link on there you'll see for membership, and uh, we would encourage you, if you're not a member, please to join. This evening, we are really pleased uh, to present uh, an extraordinary birder, outstanding naturalist, um, who truly has a gift um, for sharing his knowledge and enthusiasm uh, of the natural world with others. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. Um, this program is offered freely to our members and the general public in the spirit of generosity. If you'd like to support our programs and our mission to protect birds through community involvement, education, and conservation efforts, you can make a donation at the page linked uh, that which um, uh, through our website. Um, many thanks to, to those of you who've already done so in the past. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce fellow board member Tom Giamacello, who will serve as our Master of Ceremonies for this evening. Tom, take it away. Thank you, Pat. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Programs Committee presentation, The Fabulous Woodpeckers of Vermont with the fabulous Zach Coda. I am pleased to be able to say that Zach is a, a friend of mine and a fellow birder who has himself been on many travels around the country. He's going to fill us in on some of those. Tonight's presentation is a controlled presentation in that if you would like to ask questions of Zach, um, he is open, especially in the screens where he will have some graphics and some audio, he will take questions then. He also has a couple different sections to his presentation tonight, and he will pause at the end of each of those sections, and I will read the questions. The questions, you will ask your questions by typing them in the chat. So for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, look down at the nav bar at the bottom of your screen. You'll see there's a little chat icon. If you click that and you go over, you can type your message, and the message is going to go to myself. So without any further ado, let us start and explore the world of woodpeckers with the fabulous Zach Coda. Zach, take it away. 
Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate that. Um, I am I am really honored to be here with the Green Mountain Audubon Society, um, and very grateful to have been asked to to join you today. Um, when uh, I was first approached about doing some sort of presentation, we had a few different ideas about what people might want to learn about, and um, Clem suggested woodpeckers, and I don't know if he knew this before, but I actually am very fond of woodpeckers. Um, it was an early spark bird for me, actually. I remember seeing my first red-bellied woodpecker thinking that it, it looked so exotic compared to the downy woodpeckers I was used to seeing. So um, when he suggested that, I was immediately like, oh my goodness, I have so much to say and um, so much to share about um, woodpeckers. Um, so uh, we're going to have um, a couple sections like Tom um, shared, and I, I really appreciate your questions. So please ask questions as we go. Some of them it'll be appropriate to sort of pause um, the, and uh, talk about in the moment, and others will hold on uh, to the end. So I'll first, for you know, I, I was great to look at the people as they were coming in. Um, and seeing a lot of people I know and some old friends and um, but also a lot of new people. So for those who I haven't met yet, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm, my name is Zach Coda. I'm a, a native of Starksboro, Vermont. Um, I grew up on a little dairy farm where I was blessed to kind of be surrounded by nature and spend a lot of time outside. Um, and I uh, continued that passion um, into uh, birding and uh, degree in biology with a focus as a field naturalist um, at uh, Johnson. And I had the, the pleasure of working for years at North Branch Nature Center as a teacher naturalist, where I got to really um, explore the natural world and, and share with other people. Um, and uh, birds are really my passion. It's um, what, kind of sparked a, a new curiosity for me um, as an adult in nature. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have become a birder in Vermont, which has such a phenomenal birding community. Um, I've just spent the last year and a half traveling out west and uh, living in several different areas. Uh, and um, there are phenomenal birders and in, in wonderful communities everywhere you go, but no uh, nowhere is quite like the, the birding community we have here in Vermont. We are really blessed. Um, so the two photos I have here just to show you um, on the left is me uh, holding a Bicknell's thrush that has just been banded as part of uh, Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Um, a project looking at uh, high elevation um, breeding birds here in Vermont. Um, and on the right, I'm very excited to discover um, an American dipper nest, and that's in um, the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. Uh, so I, I really take pleasure in uh, finding birds wherever I can. Um, currently, I am a graduate student in the University of Vermont School of Nursing. So I spend most of my time either in the classroom or in the hospital. So um, I'm very glad to get to have a project to work on that wasn't healthcare related and to um, get to really think about birds for a while. So tonight we're going to talk about woodpeckers, um, where they come from, what makes a woodpecker. Um, we're going to talk about some very special woodpeckers. And then we're going to kind of pause and transition to talking specifically about the woodpeckers you might encounter here in Vermont. And then to round it out, we're going to have a conversation, all of us, about um, what woodpecker conservation might look like even in your own backyard. Um, so we're going to start off with some pretty hard science here, talking about evolution and genetics. Um, and what I want to, uh, the caveat I'll make is that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a science guy. I love talking about um, complex scientific topics, but I know that not everyone is a scientist. So um, I'm not going to shy away from the science, but I am going to try and present it at a level where I think um, everyone will be able to get something out of it. But if you have a question about something I've said or a, a graphic that's being displayed, please ask it because you're probably not the only one who has a question. So we'll talk about um, the woodpecker family tree. So um, 
they are part of the order of uh, pichiforms, um, which includes a lot of birds of the tropics. So a lot of that, that order exists either in like um, Southeast Asia or South America. Um, and it includes a, a pretty diverse bunch of, of perching birds. Um, and the one that most people would know is pretty recognizable are the toucans. So in that order that includes woodpeckers are also um, some birds like toucans. Um, but when we're talking about woodpeckers, we're going further into the family uh, Pichidae. Um, and within that family Pichidae, there are three subsets. The biggest is the Pichinae, and those are the true woodpeckers. That's what we're gonna focus on tonight is talking about the Pichinae, the woodpeckers. But also in that family, if I want you to um, get familiar with these birds you might not have seen before. One is the Rhinec, and there are only two Rhinecs in the world, but the most common and widespread is the Eurasian Rhinec, that bird on the right. And you can tell it has some characteristics similar um, to a woodpecker. You can see, um, its posture on the branch, the way its um, feet are um, positioned, um, even the bill having that really sturdy bill. Um, those are, are sort of characteristics we can see as related to a woodpecker. And then on the left, we have a piculate. Um, and those are much smaller than most of the woodpeckers we know. Um, and similar to woodpeckers, you know, they are, they have that really sturdy bill um, and uh, feet made for perching um, kind of vertically on branches. Um, but they've got some things missing too. So they're missing a, a, the stiff tail that we'll talk about. So they're not as good as perching vertically on um, branches. And they're much smaller and most of the piculates are um, about the size of a tufted titmouse. So a little bit smaller than um, most of the true woodpeckers. Within that group, um, the Pichinae, um, we have about 35 different genera, so genuses of woodpecker, um, which comprises about 208 species. Now, um, there's ongoing debate, and the more we use uh, DNA to learn about um, uh, different um, animals, the, the more we realize that things we thought were two species might be one, or the things we thought were, was one species might actually be two. So there's this constant evolution of thinking in terms of what different species are. But there's somewhere between like 195 and 210 woodpeckers in the world, um, depending on how you count them. Um, and I'm going to orient you to this graphic a little bit, and we'll start at sort of, if we look at this like a clock, we'll start at the three o'clock position um, in the brown section. And there we see the, the bird we just learned about, the rye neck. And as we go around clockwise, that's representing newer um, divergences in evolution. So when we think about the woodpecker evolution, the rye necks actually split the furthest back from the woodpeckers not long after the rhinex split off from the woodpeckers, so did the piculates. So those are, are two that are related, but they're pretty distinct from woodpeckers. And one of the older tribes of woodpeckers is the pichini. Those um, birds that you might be familiar with that is within that tribe um, are like flickers and a pileated woodpecker are within that group. So it's a little bit older getting a little bit newer now into like the nine o'clock position in the red on the left of that graphic is uh, Campifolini. So Campifolini would be um, a bird like the ivory-billed woodpecker was a Campifolini. But the, the most diverse, the most widespread and perhaps the most familiar group of uh, woodpeckers are the Melanerpini. So these would include most of the woodpeckers that live in Vermont, Things like red-bellied woodpecker, yellow-bellied sapsucker, downy and hairy woodpecker are all part of that really big, diverse uh, melanerpini group. So around the world, we have um, woodpeckers living on almost every continent. Uh, unfortunately, Australia, no woodpeckers for you. Um, but most other places have woodpeckers, um, particularly in um, uh, tropical or temperate forests. 
So if you look on the map, the places where woodpeckers are really missing are either places that are lacking trees like deserts or really high elevation places like mountain ranges and then the extremes, so the, the polar extremes. Um, and the greatest diversity is in those sort of uh, tropical forests where there's um, lots of uh, food, lots of trees, um, those where woodpeckers have really diversified. So we're talking about um, Southeast Asia, uh, Central Africa, in uh, areas like the Congo, and then in South America. And here's another graphic. Um, I don't like it as much, but it's a little bit cleaner to show you just the darker red areas. There's a uh, greater diversity of woodpecker species. And again, um, you know, lacking in areas that are lacking trees, um, and also for whatever reason, Australia. So um, a, a really interesting thing has happened in the evolution of woodpeckers, and we see um, it, everywhere woodpeckers exist, we see this phenomenon, but one really good example that we'll look at um, several times today are the downy and the hairy woodpecker. So most people, as you're learning your backyard birds, you get to know these really well. Downy woodpeckers often visit feeders and their larger cousin, the hairy woodpecker that looks almost identical, um, will come by the backyard feeder as well. And while we think of these as being closely related because they look so much alike and they're in within the same genus, they actually diverged some six and a half million years ago. So they are long split. Um, so why would these two birds look so much alike if they um, diverged so long ago? Well, one theory that's being investigated um, has to do with mimicry. So the hairy woodpecker, uh, is a, a pretty good sized woodpecker compared to a lot of the um, birds near in the forest, right? So um, think about your backyard wood, uh, backyard bird feeder. Um, when a hairy woodpecker comes in, it's pretty big compared to the titmice, the chickadees, um, the goldfinches, the other birds that are around. So when that hairy woodpecker comes in, um, it's going to be fairly dominant on the wood on the bird feeder and kind of assert itself and, and get other birds away from that food source. Um, it kind of uses its size um, uh, to, to get access to food. And the downy woodpecker is significantly smaller. It doesn't have that size um, to really bully around smaller birds to get access to food. So the theory is that it has evolved a pattern to look, to mimic, um, the larger hairy woodpecker, so that when it flies in um, and is competing for resources, um, other birds might think that it's a hairy woodpecker because it looks so much alike and treat it like it's larger um, hairy woodpecker. So that's um, one theory that's being investigated as to why these two species um, that are, are so, so far apart evolutionarily um, look so uh, much alike. And we see these pairs of look-alike woodpeckers um, around the world. So let's talk a little bit about what actually makes up a woodpecker. Um, there are a lot of characteristics that are, are unique to this group of birds. Um, one that most people notice right away is that really big bill, and within that bill and skull contain some pretty fascinating adaptations. So um, one is that tongue. Woodpeckers have an extraordinary long tongue for their size, and they're really using that to get access to food. Many woodpeckers are uh, drilling into uh, trees and uh, getting access to, to food like ants or beetle larvae. So once they've drilled that hole to access that food, they're using that long tongue to get in there and the end of that tongue is actually hard. It has a stiff point um, that is barbed. So it will um, use that to actually cling on to um, things like grubs or, or larva and pull them back out uh, to eat them. And on the right side um, graphic at the top, 
you're seeing um, this kind of strange structure that loops around the back of the skull. And you might see these two little lines that kind of connect together and wrap around the back of the skull. That's actually a bone, it's called the hyoid bone. And that's a unique adaptation for woodpeckers to deal with the force, the impact of uh, hitting its head against um, a hard surface like wood. So that hyoid bone runs from the back of the bottom jaw, so the, the mandible of the woodpecker, and wraps around the back of the skull and actually connects into the right nostril of the woodpecker. And what that does is it sort of um, cushions the skull. It sort of acts like a shock absorber. Um, and there's a complex set of muscles that connect the lower part of the bill to the hyoid bone and to the rest of the skull. And as a woodpecker is uh, drilling or drumming, that, um, that muscle is actually going to stiffen just before impact. And that's another sort of shock absorber um, that's going to um, help buffet the impact of um, striking wood. And the other difference uh, between woodpeckers and other birds and, and indeed other animals like us um, have to do with its brain. So um, if you were to look at a human brain within the skull, it has a, a lot of different folds and um, valleys within it. It's very textured. And around the brain within the skull, there is sort of a bath of fluid, of cerebrospinal fluid. And so the your brain is not like directly connected to your skull. It, it sort of has this um, little bit of fluid surrounding it. Um, but what happens when uh, a human skull stops suddenly is that brain has a little bit of space to move within that fluid and they can sort of slosh around. And we see that with impacts um, to the head is that brain sort of sloshes and can get some trauma. Um, the woodpecker's brain um, has much fewer folds on the outside. So there's um, the surface area is different. And then there's much less fluid around the brain. So um, the brain is much closer to the skull and it doesn't get that sloshing effect. Um, so that when uh, a woodpecker strikes and that force is transmitted to the skull, um, that brain doesn't have the space, the fluid space to slosh back and forth. Um, and then on the bottom left, there's um, a really interesting study on how they sort of figured out um, this hyoid bone. Um, they actually put woodpeckers in uh, a, a small plastic, clear plastic cage, and they put a little um, device, a little um, a little piece for them to, to drum or peck at, and it, and it measured the force. And they also used sort of a live action CAT scan to take imagery of the skull and the brain of the woodpecker and combine that data with the data of the force of the impact to create some pretty sophisticated computer models of what the forces involved were. And you can see um, there's a, a tremendous amount of force that's transmitted through that hyoid bone to sort of uh, protect um, the skull of the woodpecker. Um, within the beak itself, there are some adaptations. So um, woodpecker beaks are actually fairly complex and they're made up of three layers. There's a, a bone on the inside, right, um, that provides some strength, um, but there's also this sort of cushion around it, this foam layer that provides some cushioning. And then on the outside, there's this strong but flexible keratin layer. So the, the beak of the woodpecker is adapted to both be strong, but have some cushion and be uh, slightly flexible all at the same time. Um, and now this um, bird on the right is a hairy woodpecker, and it has um, a keratin disorder called AKD, um, and that causes an overgrowth of keratin. We see this sometimes in woodpeckers, but it can be other birds. Chickadees sometimes will have it, um, and 
Um, it's just an overgrowth of that keratin. And it's pretty amazing to me. Um, other birds might be able to make it, you know, with this, but woodpeckers that rely on their beaks for a living, um, uh, it's amazing to me that this hairy woodpecker is able to survive and find enough food um, with this keratin disorder. One other pretty amazing adaptation that woodpeckers have in their toes and their feet and their tails. So most perching birds that we see um, have a three and one um, arrangement of toes. So they have one toe pointing backwards, three toes pointing forwards, and that's called the nisodactyl. And so perching birds, the way um, uh, they can sort of stay upright on the branch is there's a tendon that connects that um, first toe, the toe that points backwards to the other three toes. So that when a bird lands on a branch, the downward pressure of the, from the weight of the bird on that branch pushes up on that tendon and it actually closes the bird's foot. The bird doesn't have to put any effort into closing its foot. So most songbirds like chickadees, titmice, warbler, sparrows are all anisodactyl. So when they land, their foot just automatically closes. And this is how those birds are able to sleep while they're perched upright and not just fall over. <clears throat> but woodpeckers that are designed for clinging are zygodactyl. And they actually have two toes pointing forward and two toes uh, pointing backwards in a one, two, three, four kind of rotation. Um, the other group of birds that have a similar um, a uh, similar setup to that are heterodactyl birds, and those are only the trogons. They look the same, their feet look the same, but it's just a different arrangement of toes. And I just want to mention the other group of bird feet, the semi-zygodactyl. These are owls, and um, they have a toe that can switch position. So they can either have um, uh, three and uh, one or, or two and two by swinging one of their toes. Um, and that's an adaptation to allow them to either cling or grab prey. Now there are only three woodpecker species that, are, that don't have this two and two zygodactyl um, foot. And those are the American and the European three-toed woodpecker and the blackback woodpecker. So we have two of those species in Vermont, and this is one of them pictured here. This is the American three-toed woodpecker, and you can see zoomed in there, it does indeed only have three toes, and they are facing forward. Um, this is the other uh, woodpecker that only has three toes that we have in Vermont. This is the blackback woodpecker, and you can see it's using all three of those toes to cling in a forward position. Um, woodpeckers are, are really phenomenal in the way that they're able to climb trees. Um, the other adaptation that they have is that a really stiff tail that acts as a rudder. And so they create sort of a triangle between their two clinging feet and their tail in order to stabilize themselves despite most of their weight hanging out away from the tree. Um, the graphic on the right is, is an actual graphic from um, a group of engineers that were studying woodpeckers to try and understand the physics involved in woodpeckers climbing trees. And I, I mean, I can't make much out of that graphic, um, but it is a pretty unique case study um, it, within avian physics and evolution. Um, one thing um, unique to or, or interesting about woodpeckers is that most of the woodpeckers are actually um, monomorphic. So sexually monomorphic, meaning that the both of the sexes look either the same, look identical, or look very similar and only have maybe one or two characteristics that are different. Um, and one of the few species that are not um, monomorphic or close to monomorphic is the Williamson sapsucker. Um, that's a Western relative of our yellow-bellied sapsucker. And you can see in these pictures the pretty striking differences between the male on the left that has the shiny black coat with a red um, throat and white stripes on his eye, a big white bar on its wing, and the female on the right that is a much more, more black 
gray and white barred overall. And that sort of brings us when we're talking about um, the differences between the sexes into the lives of a woodpeckers, which we're gonna start in the spring, just about what's happening now in late February, early March is courtship. So woodpeckers are courting, they're using um, a variety of displays, both um, uh, physical displays and sounds to attract mates. So on the left, we have a pair of woodpeckers that are displaying to each other um, using spread tails, spread wings, um, and different um, sort of choreographed dances that they'll use to court. And then on the right, there's a, a pair of flickers that are doing some, some kind of tail spreading and tail wagging um, as a way to communicate. And sometimes you'll see these displays um, as territorial displays between males. Um, but uh, this time of year, we're starting to see um, displays where um, males and females are courting. Um, the other part of uh, the woodpecker courtship is, is sound. Um, and I, I wish I had a, a good way to introduce some sound into this. I've had poor results in the past, so I didn't actually include sound in these, but um, I wanted to show what a diversity of woodpecker sounds might look like. So um, in the graphic to the left, it's again showing sort of an evolutionary wheel with different species. And then below each species, it's a graphic of what drumming might look like. Different woodpecker, woodpecker species use drumming. So they're actually um, taking their their bill and hitting it against a resonant object. So something that's gonna make a lot of noise. So think a hollow dead tree branch um, or some other object like that, um, that when they hit it, it's gonna resound and make a noise through the forest. And um, different woodpeckers have different paces and different um, intonations um, to separate between species. And what I found interesting about this graphic, if you look at the nine o'clock position all the way to the left, we're looking at sort of the oldest woodpecker lineage. And there's that wry neck again that we learned sort of split off really early in woodpecker evolution. And it's the wry neck split off so early that it split before woodpeckers evolved drumming. So that's a woodpecker relative that doesn't actually drum because it split off before that evolved. And then you can see going around counterclockwise, different evolutions, including a species, um, the Andean flicker that has lost its drumming. So it lost its evolutionary drumming, but there's a wide diversity of different drumming sounds and patterns um, that woodpeckers are using for courtship. Um, uh, one spring, I got a call from my grandmother <clears throat> and she, was wondering what she could do to deter this bird that was making this noise. It was coming every morning and making this really loud noise um, on a roof of her, on the roof of her neighbor's house. And so I went over and sure enough, I found the bird on the right. This is a picture of it in, in um, action. It was a yellow-bellied sapsucker, a male. And what it had found was a piece of tin on um, the roof that was uh, a little bit loose. And so the woodpecker could perch there and, um, and drill and drum against that piece of tin. And it made an immense noise because it was loose. Um, and so I've fielded questions from people before about like, you know, what do I do? This woodpecker is drumming on my house at six in the morning. Um, and so there's not a lot to be done. Um, know that it's courting season, so it's not going to last forever. At the most, it's like a month. Hopefully, hopefully he's really good. And because he found a resonant piece, he's going to get a mate soon, and that'll be the end of it. Um, but um, if it's like a loose piece of tin, uh, which is often the case, you can either, you know, secure it better um, is probably the best thing to do to make it less resonant. So the woodpecker sort of leaves. Um, or if you can take it off, that's going to dissuade the woodpecker um, from doing it. So um, 
be on the listen for woodpeckers in our woods in the next coming month or two because um, they're really going to be starting courting and you'll be able to hear some of this drumming. Um, and even within a species, there's variation. So um, there's a, a study looking at uh, sonograms of, um, and, and of drumming woodpeckers throughout their ranges. And both the hairy and the downy woodpecker, um, which have slightly different drumming patterns, within those patterns had regional variation. So the downy woodpeckers in Ontario had a different sound and pattern than the downy woodpeckers in California. And so this is sort of comparable to an accent, um, but it's really interesting to see that variation within the same species across its range. So once you've found a mate as a woodpecker, your next job is to make a home for yourself um, and your young ones. So oftentimes with woodpeckers, it's the male that is initiating this process. So sometimes, um, oftentimes the male is starting to excavate a nest cavity um, while he's courting a female. Um, and the male might actually, um, depending on the species, start excavating multiple cavities at the same time. And then he'll drum near the um, cavity and to try and attract the female over and court her. And she'll inspect it, the nest cavity. And if it's to her liking, she'll give him a signal um, that it's acceptable. And sometimes um, he'll finish that nest cavity on his own, or they will finish it um, together. They'll split the work to sort of build that cavity. Um, it really depends on the species. Some almost exclusively build new cavities every year in, um, in live trees. Um, and other species will use the same nest year after year that's in a dead tree. Um, so it, it really varies by species, whether they prefer a live tree or a dead tree and whether they're building a new nest every year or returning to the same one. But most woodpeckers are making at least one new nest hole every year. Um, so there are many old woodpecker nests around the forest. Um, and it can take anywhere from uh, three to six weeks, depending on the species, for that nest hole to be fully excavated. Um, so it is a, a, a big commitment of energy on the part of the woodpecker um, to make that home. Um, the eggs take uh, uh, anywhere from 10 to 16 days, depending on the species, um, uh, to incubate. Um, interestingly, uh, the incubation is most often split, depending on the species, between the females and the males. And the males are most often incubating at night. Um, early um, uh, in the season when they're uh, incubating eggs, um, you might see a male bring food to a female during um, the day while she is incubating the eggs, and then he's taking over at night. Um, once they start to hatch, um, they the hatchlings are actually born without any down. So most songbirds will have at least a little bit of, of sort of fluffy down on their back and on their head when they hatch, but um, woodpeckers are born completely bald, but it doesn't take them long to grow um, feathers. Um, and they, they grow very fast. And um, one of the ways you might be able to find a woodpecker nest um, in the springtime is to actually listen for begging calls of the young. So once they get to um, a certain size, they'll actually start calling out for their parents. Um, to bring them food. So a good way when you're walking through sort of a spring, a mid-spring, early summer forest to find a woodpecker nest is to just listen to the very subtle begging calls, um, high-pitched, sustained begging calls coming from a young um, woodpecker. And then um, you might find the nest hole right away, or you might be able to watch for a parent bringing in um, food to the nest and then be able to find the nest hole. Um, these birds you'll notice are banded. These are um, nestling red cockaded woodpeckers, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, so those nestlings are gonna be fed over the course of weeks. Um, the timing of, of uh, the nesting of our Northern woodpeckers coincides with the emergence of, of um, insects, both new insect larvae and adult insects emerging that have maybe um, lived through the winter as an adult. And those are really nutrient dense, protein rich foods um, for young birds. So these um, young woodpeckers are growing fast over a matter of um, weeks and then going out into the world. Um, they uh, are, are pretty good flyers right from the start, um, pretty good at climbing right from the start, uh, but a parent oftentimes is gonna be with them for maybe a week or two to help them sort of get the lay of the world as they leave the nest. Um, depending on how many young there are, that might actually be split. So in some woodpecker species, um, say if they have four nestlings, um, the female will take two and the male will take two and they'll sort of divvy up the brood as they fledge. Um, and these woodpecker nests, once they're used, they, they're empty, they're real estate within the forest. Um, and that really leaves us talking about woodpeckers as a keystone species, um, one that's really essential for um, the forest ecosystem. Those old woodpecker holes that are really throughout our landscape, anywhere there are forests, um, are used by many other animals. So um, mammals like raccoons, uh, flying squirrels, even bats will utilize old woodpecker holes. Um, some birds are, are obligate um, cavity nesters, but can't um, excavate a cavity themselves. So examples of birds that um, require that, that cavity, but can't make it themselves would be northern sawwet owls, eastern screech owls, wood ducks, hooded mergansers, buffle heads. Those are all animals that require those, those old woodpecker nests to get by. Um, some other birds that have evolved to use old woodpecker nests are tree swallows, house wrens, um, ruby crowned kinglets um, don't actually um, nest within an old woodpecker hole, but they do communally roost in old woodpecker holes as a way to sort of survive the really, really cold winter nights we have. So many other animals are using these, um, which is why it's so important to have woodpeckers on the landscape. They really enable the lives and uh, survival of many other species. All right, so here's a question for you. What is the most famous woodpecker in the US? What do you think the most famous woodpecker we have is? Oh my goodness. You know, I was thinking, no, I was thinking people were gonna be serious with this and I was gonna make a joke and you all ruined my punchline. Of course, it's Woody the Woodpecker, right? Um, and uh, Woody Woodpecker, people have asked me like, what kind of woodpecker do you think Woody is? And I mean, he's not really, um, he's kind of a, a red-bellied or a red-headed woodpecker. He has that bright red um, head, but they don't really have a crest like he has. And I don't know any woodpeckers that wear gloves either. So, um, uh, but yeah, I think um, in terms of the most famous actually live or existing um, woodpecker um, is probably this one, the ivory-billed woodpecker. So um, Campiphilus principalis um, was a woodpecker that lived um, in the southeast, um, in the American southeast, and it was the largest woodpecker known to have existed in North America. Um, people called it the Lord God bird because when people would see it, um, they would exclaim um, because it, it would just cause them to, to, to exclaim and, and to uh, take a moment because it was so impressive. It, it was um, almost 21 inches long, um, which is uh, like the size of an American crow. It had this massive white um, bill like a chisel um, and had these big white wing patches on both the upper and underside of its wings. Um, it had this big red crest. The males had this big red crest. 
Um, so it was a, a, a really impressive bird. Um, it fed primarily on beetle larvae, but it also ate some nuts and seeds and berries um, from time to time. Um, it, it lived in the Southeast um, in uh, some lowland forests, some, ripe, some big riparian forests, um, and it really had three requirements um, within its habitat. Um, it needed to have pretty extensive and continuous forests, so pretty um, big areas of unbroken forest that had very large trees. So we're talking trees that are massive and old, like over a hundred years old. Um, and then it had to have these trees die. So it had to have something to kill the trees and it had to have this continuous supply of recently dead trees. And so as um, humans started to impact, as um, colonists started to um, impact that landscape, um, cutting down trees, fragmenting forests, the, um, the places for this woodpecker to live um, declined. And one of the problems with being such a, a big species that requires a, a really um, a significant um, amount of area for, for one pair is that the more broken up that is, the the more the further they have to go in order to get the resources they need, um, and there's suddenly just not not enough space for this animal. Um, it was often thought of a swamp dweller because it lived in these kind of um, southern swamplands with these big trees, but it it wasn't like in the lower dark swampy parts. It was often up in the high canopies um, and and sometimes would even fly over the canopy to move between different patches um, within the forest. And so that brings us to talking about like the status of the ivory-billed woodpecker. So by the time people really started to study this bird in earnest, it was the, you know, the early 1900s, and it was already pretty rare. By the time they started putting serious effort into studying it, it was it was already rare and it was already declining. Um, there's a famous series of photos and, and video taken by Arthur Allen um, in April of 1935 in Louisiana in this in this area of forest um, that was about to be logged called the Singer Tract. Um, and uh, it provides a really fascinating glimpse. I, I recommend people, um, if you haven't seen the video, um, it's short clips, but it's it's pretty amazing to see what this bird looked like. Um, and then it was uh, James Tanner who took the last really universally accepted photos of ivory builds um, in 1938, um, at least the last known ones in, in North America and in the United States. And then in uh, Cuba, the last photos of the species were taken in April of 1949. So it's been a long time um, since we've really seen evidence of ivory-billed woodpeckers um, anywhere on the planet. And so that brings us to 2004, um, when a gentleman named David Luno was uh, canoeing through uh, the Cache River National Wildlife Refuge in Arkansas in what's pretty classic historical ivory-billed woodpecker habitat. Um, he had a camera propped up. Um, he was actually interested in, in observing all sorts of wildlife, but had on his mind that, you know, this is where ivory builds might live if they still existed and wanted to potentially capture um, an incidental video. And so he um, encountered a bird that he took a video of um, and that he claimed um, and shared and claimed to be an ivory-billed woodpecker. So obviously once he shared this, other people went, um, including some notable ornithologists who claimed to have their own sightings. Um, and, uh, but really the, the evidence that came out of 2004 was a four second video. Um, and this video has been really debated. So what I've included here on the right are, um, uh, an image of the the pileated woodpecker, which is looks similar. It's in a different genus, but it's still pretty big and looks similar. So we have a pileated woodpecker, 
uh, up above and ivory billed woodpecker below. And what you'll notice is on the underside of the wing of the pileated, there are these big broad white patches and a black trailing edge. And in the ivory build uh, uh, below, there are white patches on the front, on the back, and on the upper side of the wing. So extensive white um, on the ivory build, but also some white on the underside of the wing um, of the pileated. And the big discussion about these, um, the Luno video, is which way is the woodpecker flying? And when the woodpecker is flying, um, many woodpecker species will take these deep sort of rowing motions with their wings. And so the question is in the stills, so if you look at um, down below, it's A, the top row are the Luno, are stills from the Luno video. Um, it looks like the upper side of the wing, but a lot of people, including some notable uh, bird experts like David Sibley um, contend that that was actually a rowing downward motion. And what you're seeing in the Luno video is the underside of a pileated wing and not the upper side of an ivory billed wing. And to sort of counter um, the original claim um, on that bottom row B are stills from videos of known pileated woodpeckers that provide very similar um, amounts of white in very similar positions. So um, there are some people that still believe that the Luno video is a genuine ivory-billed woodpecker sighting and that the people that went to look for it after the Luno video in the same place who claim to have had encounters, you know, that those are, are um, verifiable encounters. Um, but there have since that point been no really clear verifiable evidence that is clear photos, cl really clear video, video um, DNA evidence. Um, if this is starting to sound a bit like searching for Sasquatch, um, you're, you're, you're not wrong. There is, um, there is a lot of debate in the ornithology community about this bird and some of it feels um, a little wild at times. And so that brings us to um, the, the kind of the fallout um, of the Luno video, including Tim Gallagher, um, who was then the editor of The Living Bird and, and um, good friends with John P Fitzpatrick, who was the director of the Cornell Lab. And they made this big announcement in 2005 that the ivory build had been rediscovered based on um, the Luno video and subsequent um, word of mouth um, in count, uh, reports. Um, and Tim Gallagher, who went after the Luno video and, and claimed to have an encounter with it, wrote the book called The Grail Bird, which became very popular. And then there was a documentary about the book. So if you're interested in learning more about this whole debacle, read The Grail Bird, go find the documentary. Um, and then in just last year, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposed delisting the species. So um, up until then, the ivory-billed woodpecker had been listed as a critically endangered species. And what that means under the law, under the Endangered Species Act, is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is compelled to create a management plan. So they have to invest resources not only in creating a plan, a conservation plan, so steps toward um, conserving the species, but they have to invest resources in enacting that plan. So having the status as, as endangered really requires the Fish and Wildlife Service to put a tremendous amount of resources toward this species. Um, now, some have said, some have said that even if the ivory build is indeed extinct, it's worth keeping it listed as an endangered species because the work that Fish and Wildlife is going to do to conserve habitat and um, and and um, improve the area that this species used to live in is going to benefit other species. And they're not wrong, but the Fish and Wildlife Service um, has limited resources. We're sort of at a crisis point when it comes to conservation, um, and we don't have 
the money to conserve every species. It's very sad to say, but we we literally cannot save every species at this point. We have to we have to make decisions about what projects get funded and and what um, areas get left behind. Um, shortly after the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed delisting, so essentially um, recognizing the ivory-billed woodpecker as extinct, this group called Project Principalis released a report entitled Multiple Lines of Evidence Indicate Survival of the Ivory-Billed Woodpecker. So they did this just after the comment period had ended, which prompted the Fish and Wildlife Service to go back and issue a six-month um, extension uh, to their decision, reopen the comment period, and include this as evidence. Um, and at the time when this first came out, it was, it was, you know, it was extremely exciting. Everyone was rushing to read the report. I read the whole report, and by the end of it, I was left with more questions than, it, than answers. Um, a lot of it has um, to do with really grainy, a lot of the evidence is really grainy photos that are, are inconclusive, um, including the, the best evidence that they, they claim to have is um, drone footage of a, of a bird in flight. Um, and uh, that's the still from the drone footage. Um, and uh, I would love to believe this animal still exists. I would love to see, I would love to see an ivory billed woodpecker. Um, but I don't think we've had conclusive evidence yet, and I don't think that's worth putting the resources in at this point. Um, so um, we're going to move on from the ivory-billed woodpecker and talk about um, another superlative woodpecker, which is the world's largest woodpecker, um, the imperial woodpecker, which is a, actually a close relative of the ivory-billed woodpecker. You can see they look very similar. Um, and in fact, it was referred to as the Mexican ivory-billed woodpecker, um, except unfortunately, this bird is also likely extinct um, for similar reasons to the ivory-billed woodpecker. And so that leaves us with the world's largest woodpecker being um, the great slady woodpecker. And it's a really impressive bird. They are massive at, at 23 inches, so even bigger than an ivory-billed woodpecker would have been. Um, but they have this sort of um, kind of uh, gray coloring, some peach on their face, this kind of orangey throat. They're really gaunt looking. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's a fascinating looking bird. Um, and you can immediately recognize it as a woodpecker as well. It's got that stiff tail, that upright posture, that big chisel bill, um, but looking really unlike any woodpecker we have here in North America. Um, another woodpecker that I want to mention um, is one that we have the chance to really save, and that's the red cockaded woodpecker. Um, this is a woodpecker that has a, a really specific habitat niche, um, and it's been pretty consistently declining here um, in North America, where it's endemic. And so um, I would love to see more resources put toward this species that um, we really have a chance to save. Um, and so uh, they live primarily in um, the Southeast uh, and they, they really depend on these old growth uh, Southern pine forests. Uh, they've been listed as endangered since uh, 1968. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service has developed a plan and been working on conserving this species. Um, unfortunately, they often get outcompeted for territory by the larger and more aggressive red-bellied woodpecker. There are some other factors going into this, um, but there's also been some really good work in conserving it, and that is uh, habitat management, so improving those southern pine forests, um, using cavity restrictors, so actually putting guards outside of um, the around the entrance to their cavities so other species can't access them. Um, and actually moving young females, um, red cockaded woodpeckers in between different groups um, to help improve the genetic diversity. Um, so this is a species that um, we have an opportunity to make a difference for now. And, and I'm hoping that resources will continue to go toward that. 
Um, I want to share with you some other really interesting woodpeckers, not, not um, necessarily seen here in Vermont, um, but ones you could travel to go see and I, I think are just really unique and striking. Um, so this is a woodpecker of the West called the Lewis's woodpecker, and there's nothing else that looks or acts like it. Um, it is a woodpecker that often travels in groups, um, and it has this beautiful, like, glossy green wings and back. It has um, this dark, glossy red and green head. Its underside is, like, bright pink, and its neck has this, like, subtle kind of lavender color to it. Um, it uh, often fly catches, so it'll, it'll sit out on a branch, fly out, catch a bug, fly back to that branch, so it acts often like a fly catcher. Um, and it flies like a crow. So most woodpecker species, when they fly, um, they sort of do this undulating or wave-like flight where they'll flap a few times really fast and that'll increase their elevation. So they'll go up and they'll sort of coast and come back down. And then they come back down, they'll flap a few times in quick succession and gain elevation and sort of become this sort of wave-like pattern where they're flapping a bunch then coasting. But the Lewis's woodpecker has these sort of steady, big, rowing um, uh, flight that looks very much like a crow. And in fact, they're a little bit shaped like a crow and they're pretty dark. So the first time I saw one, um, I almost passed it off as a crow. I saw it flying over. I was like, well, that's a weird looking crow. And I was like, that's a Lewis's woodpecker. Um, so pretty amazing bird. Um, there has actually been one record of Lewis's woodpecker in Vermont. I think it was back in 2007 in Linden, Vermont. Um, and so it's interesting, while this species is, is pretty consistently in the Intermountain West, um, they do sometimes show up in weird places. So that one in Vermont was what we would call a vagrant. Um, and there's actually a vagrant Lewis's woodpecker right now in Ontario. Um, north of Toronto that lots of people have been going to see. So maybe someday we'll get a Lewis, another Lewis's woodpecker here in Vermont. I'm, I'm holding out hope. Um, here's another really unique woodpecker. I said earlier that most of our woodpeckers are found in areas where there are, are forests or trees. That's how they make a living. And th there's only a couple of species that, that don't live in truly forested areas. And this is one. Um, the Gila woodpecker um, is living in essentially our Sonora Desert, and they're making a living on cactus. So they're actually drilling into cactus um, to make their nest holes, and, and they're living in the deserts. They're creating nest holes, and this cactus is providing a really important resource within their ecosystem, including for or um, one of my favorite birds, the smallest owl in the world, the elf owl there on the left. So elf owls rely um, in some areas on um, the old nest holes of the Gila woodpecker um, as their nests. One more woodpecker um, here in, in Western North America that I think is so unique, both in its um, appearance and its behavior is the acorn woodpecker. So this is a woodpecker that, again, also often lives in groups. Um, and they collect acorns. They cache the acorns. So they'll drill holes in the side of a dead tree. And then they'll come and they'll put the acorn in and sort of tap it into position. And then as that acorn dries, um, it'll kind of shrink. And so they'll go around and they'll tap on the acorn. And if it's loose, they'll pull that acorn out. They'll go find another hole in which that acorn just fits to hold it in and it'll drill it into place. So you'll see these family groups of acorn woodpeckers with this big tree, dead tree full of acorns and they'll go around tending it. And it's just really fascinating behavior. And they're really unique looking. They kind of, kind of got this like um, clown makeup looking face, um, a really cool species. Um, and with that, I'm gonna just pause for a moment and offer an opportunity to ask questions before we launch into talking about what woodpeckers you might see um, here at home in Vermont. Well, Zach, I think you have knocked the ball out of the park because uh, at present, we have no questions being typed into the chat. And again, I'll remind folks that if they do wanna ask Zach a question, the only opportunity is to type it into the chat 
and then I will relay it to Zach. Zach, so far, so good. Let's come home to Vermont. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm going to stick around at the end. Um, so I, and I'll talk about birds all night long. So feel free to hang out afterwards and ask questions um, or just chat about how much you love woodpeckers. I do see one question in there. So I'll pause. How is that long tongue stored in the mouth of the woodpecker? Ah, that's a really great question. I'm not going to backtrack to that visual, but I'll have you remember um, the hyoid bone. So that bone that goes from the bottom jaw, the mandible up and around the back and connects to that right nostril of the woodpecker. That hyoid bone splits and then reconnects. Um, and that groove actually allows the tongue to go all the way around the back of the head and curl up around the back of the head. So it's that, that long tongue actually curls around the groove created by the hyoid bone. Um, so it's, it's a pretty amazing to think where, how does this huge long tongue manage to stay in the mouth, but it doesn't actually stay all within the mouth of the bird. It, it curls around back. Zach, I'm going to have to break in. Uh, I am not able to see anybody's questions, so that's that's on me. It must have been something in the setup. So I'm no. afraid not only are you going to present, but you're going to have to kind of field the questions over in the chat as well. No worries. And I'm going to forge on from here. Um, we don't have that much time or material left. I'm going to try and speed through it a little bit because we're we're familiar with these birds a little bit. So um, we'll save the rest of the questions till the end. So here in Vermont, we have seven species that we're really familiar with that breed here um, and that spend at least um, part, if not all, of their lives here in Vermont. And then we have three species um, that are here occasionally. Um, the red-headed woodpecker and the American three-toed woodpecker um, are not recorded annually, um, but both have nested in Vermont in the past. And then, of course, that Lewis's woodpecker that's only been here once. So I'm going to start off with this one, the red-headed woodpecker. Um, this is a, a really beautiful woodpecker. Um, it has this bright red head that extends down the nape, the back of the neck, down the throat and to sort of this bib around the chest. Um, the underside of the woodpecker is all white. It has a black back and black wings, except for this big white bar, um, this white trailing edge um, on the wing uh, that when folded creates this kind of white saddle. Um, on the right, you can see a, a woodpecker that has its adult, its red adult head, but it still retained its juvenile white feathers that have um, two black stripes across the wing. Um, the, uh, on the left here, we have an adult red-headed woodpecker, um, and you can see how that bright red head extends down into a little red bib. Um, and then on the right are two pictures of a juvenile red-headed woodpecker. So um, doesn't have that red head yet, but you can still see it has that white saddle on the on the wings when folded with two black stripes across and a little bit of red coming in on the head. Um, a lot, not a lot, but a fair amount of the now sparse red-headed woodpecker records we have in Vermont are juveniles. Um, and sometimes go unnoticed or unrecognized at first because they don't have that bright red head yet. So be on the lookout for juvenile red-headed woodpeckers because they do come through Vermont fairly regularly. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that red-headed woodpeckers, though they're in this Melanerpes group that often spend a lot of time in trees, um, they get most of their food either by flycatching or by stooping down to get beetles or grasshoppers off the ground. So about 40% of the food that red-headed woodpeckers get, they're actually, um, are actually bugs they're fly catching for or getting off of the ground. They're one of only four woodpeckers, along with that acorn woodpecker that store food. And they're the only woodpecker that will actually store food in a tree and then cover it up with bark to hide it, which is, is pretty neat. Um, they nest very late. Um, the core of their range is in the southeast, um, uh, but here in Vermont, they're, they're a relatively late nester when they have nested in the past. Um, 
they're usually using dead trees or like a dead snag on a live tree. And unusual for woodpeckers, they have a really uh, strong nest site fidelity, meaning they'll come back to the same tree, the same nest every year. Um, this is a sexually monomorphic species, meaning both the males and the females look identical as adults. Um, but the males perform almost all of the nest hygiene, meaning when there are nestlings in the nest, they're carrying the fecal sacs out to keep that nest clean. The males, I think it's something like 98% of the nest hygiene. Um, and you wonder how did they figure this out if the males and the females look alike? Um, they actually did a study where they color banded adults they, they captured adult pairs at a nest site, they DNA tested them, they color banded them, and then they watched them to see which was coming and going from the nest doing what to figure out sort of the, the sex, sexual roles um, within the pair and discovered that most of the time it's the, the male woodpecker that's cleaning up around the nest. And that um, turns out to be true for some other um, species in this genus as well. So uh, in Vermont, they used to live um, pretty consistently in, in the Champlain Valley. Um, even though Vermont is at the northeast end of the range, um, they've really declined. They are what we would consider um, extirpated as a breeder or no longer breeding here in Vermont. Um, and that really has to do with the way we've changed the landscape. They like sort of open uh, areas with big trees. So if you were to picture a golf course where you have these kind of big open grassy areas interspaced with like big mature tall trees, that's a redheaded woodpecker's dream. But there's not a lot of habitat like that left in Vermont. Um, so they've all but disappeared in our state. A close relative that the opposite has come to our state is the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, it often gets confused or called a red-headed woodpecker because indeed it does have this big red stripe that runs um, over the top of its head. But you'll notice its face and it's the front of its, um, its neck uh, are, are this sort of gray color. They're not red like the red-headed woodpecker. It's called the red-bellied woodpecker. It's a little bit of a misnomer because the red can be very subtle. And the woodpecker in the middle, you can see just a little bit of a tinge of red underneath that bird. And that's about all you get for the red belly on this bird. Um, the males and the females do look different. So the two birds on the left are males. And you can see that red um, goes all the way from the, the bill over the top of the head and meets to the patterning on the back, that beautiful like um, striped black and white pattern on its back. The bird on the right is a female and you can see from the top of her bill to about the top of her head, the front is gray. It doesn't have that red stripe. So that's a female on the right. <clears throat> Here's a, another look at a female red-bellied woodpecker on the left and on the right is a juvenile and you can see um, it doesn't yet have any red on its head that'll grow in later, but it does have that black and white striped pattern on its back. Um, Red-bellied woodpeckers are really generalists. They can make a living just about anywhere and they'll eat just about anything. Interestingly, they're very well known to be nest robbers. So they'll actually, um, birds that have like open cup nests like warblers and vireos, they'll actually go in and even eat eggs or even nestlings of those species. Um, so interesting to think of a woodpecker um, as a vertebrate carnivore. Um, the males will often hold their territory year round and the females in the non-breeding season will kind of wander and explore. Um, the male will start a nest cavity and then attract the female with a call. This is a woodpecker that doesn't um, really drum to attract its mate and it will make a, a, a vocalization. Uh, and then if she likes that, he'll actually go in the nest cavity and he'll drum, he'll tap very gently and she'll poke his, her head in. And if she looks around and she likes the place, she'll also tap with him and they'll begin tapping in unison. And that's the signal that um, 
they're a mated pair and they're going to make they're going to finish this nest together and they're going they they work together to finish that nest cavity um uh this is a species we didn't used to have in vermont it's um used to live primarily in the southeast but it's really um moved in in the last few decades um, between the first and the second breeding bird atlas um it increased by 1800 percent so it went from zero to eight um, areas of the state. Um, and uh, a couple reasons for this expansion, um, as a generalist, it can make use of all sorts of different habitats. Um, it does fairly well with human habitation. Um, so it can live fairly well alongside people. Um, Climate change has helped a lot. It's actually, of all of our woodpecker species, it's perhaps the most sensitive to cold temperatures in the winter. So um, young birds just do not survive if it's really cold and they don't get enough food. So as our winters have warmed, it's been easier for these birds to survive. And um, bird feeders have actually really helped overwintering success um, for these birds, particularly juveniles. Um, so uh, we, global warming has certainly improved the chances for these moving north. Um, and so have people um, feeding with bird feeders. Just to sort of visualize the rapid range expansion um, on the right, you can see that they were um, primarily in the Southeast. They kind of came a little bit into Western New York, um, but certainly not in New England at all. And then starting in the 60s, they're creeping up the 70s. They're pretty well established in places like Long Island. Um, by the 80s, they're in southern New England. The 90s, they're in southern Vermont. Um, and now they're even found, um, you know, on both sides of the state, Connecticut River Valley, Champlain Valley. They're now becoming established in central Vermont along the Winooski River Valley. They're sort of spreading up those river valleys that are a little bit warmer um, we're talking about like a microclimate, a little bit warmer um, than surrounding areas. And you can see on the map to the left that they're really avoiding um, the colder, higher elevation areas. So in New York, um, they've kind of gone around the Adirondacks both directions, right? They've kind of avoided it. And in Vermont, they've spread up the Champlain Valley and up the Connecticut River Valley and avoided that colder um, spine, and um, they're really expanding up the coast of Maine where it's a little bit warmer and there are more people too. Um, here's perhaps our most familiar woodpecker, so I won't spend a lot of time on this one. Everyone knows the downy woodpecker. Um, if you've walked through the forest, if you've hung up a, a bird feeder, you've probably seen this bird. Um, they're pretty small um, and they are uh, uh, mildly sexually dimorphic. So there's a little bit of subtle difference between the males and the females. The males have a bit of a red spot on the back of their head. So the birds on the outside pictures are males and the bird in the middle picture is a female. Um, and one clue to separate this bird from the very similar hairy woodpecker is the size of the bill. So on the bird on the left, we can see that bill is really short, um, especially compared to the size of the head. So we a good guide is looking at the length of the bill compared to the width of the head. And if the bill is about half the width or less than the width of the head, um, that's likely a downy woodpecker. Um, and you can also see the tail feathers um, of both the downy and the hairy woodpecker are white on those outside feathers. On the downy woodpecker, um, those feathers have some black dots versus the hairy woodpecker, those white outside tail feathers will be clean white. Um, that's a really good field mark. And if you get a bird like the bird on the right that has these big black spots on those white outside tail feathers, you know for sure it's a downy woodpecker. But sometimes you get birds that either have very faint spotting or their tail feathers have worn. So the bird on the left, you can't really see any black dots on those white outside tail feathers, even though we know by other characteristics, the size, the size of the bill, 
um, that it's indeed a downy woodpecker. So downy woodpeckers can um, make a living in a variety of habitats. Um, they do fairly well in edge habitats. So as we've sort of um, broken up the landscape, um, they've, they've managed to do fairly well. Um, and they love bird feeders. Um, and that's a pretty good clue. Most of the like standard um, hardware store suet feeders um, are about six inches um, by six inches. So if you see a downy woodpecker, uh, if you see um, a black and white woodpecker on one of those suet feeders and it's about the same size or smaller, um, that's probably a downy. So those suet feeders can actually be a, a good field. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the bird on the right we can see is a male. He's got that red spot. And then we can see those zygodactyl toes really well. So that's a really good image showing the two toes facing forward and the two toes facing back. Um, they're beginning breeding fairly early. So they're starting um, in March or sometimes early February if it's mild. So um, start listening now for the drumming of downy woodpeckers. And interestingly, the females are initiating a lot of the courtship that's happening. Um, they've actually increased a little bit um, and primarily increasing in the northern Green Mountains. So they're, they're moving north a little bit um, and um, we're in the core of their range. So um, this is a bird that we're, we're pretty certain that we're going to have um, in Vermont um, going forward. Here is a, a, the, the other species that looks like it. Oh, I didn't change the Latin name. Um, Taxonomists love moving birds around between genus, changing Latin names. And so this is one where the Latin name just changed, but I forgot to change this one. Um, so this is the hairy woodpecker. It's the bigger cousin of the downy woodpecker. And you can see it looks remarkably similar. Um, the key differences are those outside woodpecker, uh, those outside feathers on its tail are clean white. They don't have any black dots. And then that bill is a little bit longer, especially compared to the, um, the head. So if that bill is um, more than half the width of the head, um, you're probably looking at a hairy. Uh, the other thing in the name hairy woodpecker comes from the really prominent nasal bristles. So those bristles um, on the top of the bird's beak that sort of protect um, both its nostrils and its eyes from flying wood chips when it's excavating. Those stiff bristles um, are, um, are a little bit more prominent in the hairy than with the downy. And just like the downy, the females lack that red spot and the males have a, a red spot on the um, back of their head. Um, they're one of the most widespread uh, woodpeckers in North America. America. They go all the way from Alaska to the, the Baja, California, and Mexico, all the way from the mountains of Central America, all the way over to Florida and up the Atlantic coast. Um, so anywhere there are mature woodlands, the hairy woodpecker can make a living. Um, they're starting um, their um, courtship this time of year. They're uh, pairing up and then they're laying eggs from sort of early May through mid-June. It takes about 12 days for them to incubate the eggs. And then we're seeing fledglings um, starting in June and going through July. Um, hairy woodpeckers, they feed on a variety of things, but some things that they will really like is um, tent caterpillars. There, um, a lot of birds won't eat tent caterpillars, but hairy woodpeckers will. Um, and they also like the M bark beetle. So some of our invasive forest pests, um, uh, invasive insects, these hairy woodpeckers will help, help um, tamp down. Um, you'll notice that there's something a little bit different about this bird on the right. Um, and uh, it's kind of discolored. Um, this is not um, something to do with the pigment of the bird. This is staining. So this is tannin staining. And many species that excavate their own nest cavity 
um, can get this tannin staining. So if the tree has a lot of tannins that are leaking out while it's actually excavating the nest, um, those can stain the white feathers of the bird. And so that's not an uncommon thing. Typically we see it on the tail of the bird. So if you look at enough woodpecker tails, you'll see it. Um, we don't often see birds that have this extensive staining. It really depends on, um, on the tree they've selected. Um, this is a bird that's increased. So as um, we have less, as we have fewer farms in Vermont and um, our forests are maturing, um, the hairy woodpecker has a little bit more habitat. So we're in the core of its range um, and it's sort of increased its, its breeding success. Here's one that you're unlikely to see in Vermont. This is that American three-toed woodpecker. Um, it's a, a really unique um, species in that three-toed adaptation. Um, it loves um, boreal forests. Um, and on the right, you're seeing a male with some yellow on its head. Um, and they, they also this three-toed woodpecker has that um, white back, which will help differentiate it from the black-backed woodpecker we're going to learn about in a couple of minutes. Um, this is a bird that really needs dead or dying um, conifers, so like spruces um, to survive. Uh, they like burned areas, so if an area of uh, like uh, boreal forest is burned, they'll move right in there and they're going to live on the insects that, that are living on those burned trees. Um, they'll also like insect killed tree areas, areas where beaver has flooded and killed a bunch of trees, um, or actually logging areas. And they have a distinctive drumming. Um, so one of the best ways to find them is to actually in their breeding habitat, listen for that distinctive drumming during the breeding season. But they can be um, otherwise uh, fairly difficult to find because they're living in really dense forests and they're, they're pretty quiet. Um, so they have technically decreased by 100% in Vermont um, between the first and the second breeding bird atlas, but there was only one record. So there was one record in the first and no records in the second atlas. So it's declined 100%, but it's a pretty sparse and irregular breeder. Um, it may breed more regularly. It's really hard to survey for because the places where it's breeding in the um, Northeast Kingdom, it's really hard to access its habitat. Um, and um, there just aren't that many of them. So it's possible that there are three-toed woodpeckers still breeding in Vermont, but it's just very difficult to find them. Um, and climate change, the destruction of boreal habitat is going to continue to push this um, species further north and, and unfortunately likely out of Vermont um, for good in the future. Um, its close relative is the blackback woodpecker. So you can see a lot of similarities, similarities to this. Um, on the underside, white, it has some like black checkered streaking on the underside, a primarily black head with a white stripe. Um, but the back of this bird is all kind of beautiful glossy black. Um, and again, male sporting that yellow on the front of its head. Um, you can see on the bird on the right, that stiff tail working hard like a rudder to support that bird. Um, this is a bird that is really closely dependent on um, boreal forests. They love burnt forest habitats um, and they depend primarily on the larva of wood boring beetles. Um, one uh, really cool thing is that the the black back is is hypothesized to be an adaptation for living in these recently burned forests. So that um, black back kind of matches this the glossy soot of a burned tree, so that it's less likely to be spotted by predators when it's foraging. Um, in Vermont, they're pretty much exclusively found in black spruce forests. Up in the Northeast Kingdom, are the little bit of boreal forest we have, um, and most of the diet is that wood boring uh, larva. Um, they have actually increased by 60%. So um, part of that um, 
uh, is due to probably a, a, a better surveying effort, um, a better understanding of its habitat. Um, and uh, that, that bird is really, as you can see, restricted to that corner of Vermont. Um, it's also increased in, in nearby New York State as well. Um, and it's listed as a, as a species of greatest conservation need uh, because its habitat is so specific. Um, and uh, there are some management practices happening in the Northeast Kingdom to specifically improve the habitat for this bird. Um, this is a bird that is just about unmistakable here in Vermont, the pileated woodpecker. Um, it's our largest woodpecker. It's almost the size of a crow. It has this massive chisel bill. Um, it's extremely loud and it sports this bright red crest. When you see it, there is no mistaking a pileated woodpecker. Um, this is a species that also has a subtle difference between males and females. On the left, that male, the crest, the red crest starts at the, the top of the bill and goes all the way to the back of the head. And it also is sporting a little red patch, a uh, little red mustache on the side of its face. The female on the right, um, her red crest is more on the top of her head. Her forehead is more gray and she doesn't have that red um, patch on the side of her face. Um, they love um, extensive woodlands. They love old forests with big trees. Um, they're often secretive and sparse on the landscape, but they're very loud. So if you're walking through the forest um, and you hear the super loud call, um, you're gonna know there's a, a pileated woodpecker. Uh, they love carpenter ants. They love wood boring beetle larvae, which um, leads them to create these really distinctive patterns, foraging patterns on trees. So the photo on the left, these really long, deeply gouged uh, foraging patterns um, are, are pretty much guaranteed to be a pileated woodpecker. Um, and so you can see if you have pileated woodpeckers around, um, by seeing these freshly excavated, um, elongated, deep um, gouges and trees. Um, they'll also eat fruit though. I've seen them fairly regularly um, taking, you know, fruit off of vines, uh, like in the fall. Um, they're nesting they're, um, in the spring. They're laying eggs um, in mid-June, July through June, and then um, they're fledging in June and July, and uh, like I mentioned, the parents are splitting the brood. So um, some of the young are going to go with the, the male and learn how to be a woodpecker, and some of the uh, young are going to go with the female and learn how to be a woodpecker. Um, and they've increased as well as our forests have matured, um, and the greatest increase has been in the Northeast Highlands, um, where there's more forest. We're in the core of this bird's range, so it's one we're gonna have um, for a long time. Um, the Northern Flicker is also a unique woodpecker in that it's not um, the black and white that we're used to seeing. It's this interesting tan pattern um, with black uh, specks or dots on its front and um, on its back. Uh, this one is, uh, has a subtle difference between males and females as well. On the left, we have a female flicker. Uh, she has a very tan face and that red spot behind her head. The male on the right also has that red spot behind his head, but he has this black mustache. So that black mustache um, shows us that that's a male northern flicker on the right. Um, they are strongly migratory because they are primarily eating ants. They are often ground feeders, so you'll see northern flickers often on the ground um, eating colonies of ants. And so when that ground starts to freeze, when we get snow, they can't find food anymore, they head south. Um, but they're coming back as soon as that snow is gone. And by mid-April, they're pairing up, they're making a nest. They um, pr prefer aspens um, and they're making a new nest every year. Um, there are, uh, there's variation within northern flickers. Here in the east, we have what are called yellow shafted northern flickers. 
And that means the shaft or center part of each feather is this bright yellow color. And that photo on the right, you can see those bright yellow shafts. In the western part of the range, it's actually a red shafted flicker. So you can see it's this very like bright orangey red color to those feathers instead of that yellow. And uh, the other difference is on the left, that male woodpecker, instead of a black mustache, they've got a red mustache. So these were previously thought of as different species, but now we know they're one species with some variation. And even in the middle, you get some orange flickers that are intergrades that have a little bit um, characteristics of, of both um, Eastern and Western. Um, they've decreased a little bit in Vermont. Um, there's not um, a ton of concern for them, but there's uh, there are fewer uh, trees available for nesting. Um, and as we uh, sort of reduce the amount of ants and other invertebrates on our lawns, there's less um, food available for them. And then the last species to talk about um, is another really unique one, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. While it, it may look similar to the black and white hairy um, and downy woodpeckers, it, it lives a totally different life. Um, so this is a woodpecker that um, uh, has a, a black and white pattern, but it's a little bit different, a little more mottled on the back. And then the head, the front of the head in the males has a little bit of a, a red forehead and red on the throat. The females um, will lack the red on the throat. Um, males are shown here on the left and right, and in the middle is a juvenile that's still um, getting a little bit of red on that throat, but uh, hasn't yet gotten the red on top of its, on its forehead. This is a female pictured on the right. You can see that red on top of her head, um, but lacking that red throat. Um, it lives up to its name and makes its living um, sucking sap. So in the spring, when trees start moving, uh, moving water from their roots and sending that sap up the trunk of the tree, this bird is going to drill little holes called wells in the bark of the tree to let that sap ooze out, and then it's drinking that sap. Um, and so we don't have yellow-bellied sap suckers often in the winter here in Vermont because they have a hard time finding enough food. So most of them are coming back um, sometimes in March if the weather is mild, but mainly by the second week of April. And then they're leaving us again, usually in October. Sometimes we find them trying to overwinter, lingering until Christmas bird counts, but it's, it's not often. Um, and uh, they have a really unique drumming that um, if you're not familiar with it, it sounds sort of like Morse code. It's, it's very irregular versus like a hairy or a woodpecker. It has a pretty steady, fast drumming sound. This one sounds very much like Morse code. Um, they're nesting primarily in aspens, and they really like aspens that have this specific fungal infection um, that affects the heartwood of the tree, but it leaves the sapwood intact, um, and that's just perfect for them to make their nest. Um, and uh, they have a really, um, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So they've increased um, by 8% in Vermont, again, as our forests have grown up. Um, as agriculture has left the state. Um, and so they're doing really well here. They have a unique relationship with another species you might not expect um, that actually follows them on their migration. Uh, and that is the ruby-throated hummingbird. So most people think of ruby-throated hummingbirds as returning to Vermont just in time for flowers to bloom. Um, but they're actually coming back a little bit before that. Um, they're coming back after the yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Um, and what the ruby-throated hummingbirds will actually do is follow yellow-bellied sapsuckers around after they've drilled wells and they'll rob um, sap. They'll drink the sap out of the sap wells. Um, and so that's the last woodpecker I had to talk about. Um, and it brings us to talking about what we can do in terms of conserving woodpeckers. And, and leaving woodpeckers for future generations to enjoy. So 
Um, I'm going to ask you all to contribute now and take some suggestions. What do people think about um, how we can protect this really important group of birds? Um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat too. So feel free to leave suggestions. Um, Zach, the way we have the way we have structured this, nobody nobody can speak to you. Oh, so you I can, see. You can I, only hear things in the chat. Yeah, I do see some things in the chat already. Um, one person suggesting leave dead trees if it's safe to do so. Um, absolutely, that's a really good one. And you know, our instinct, especially in our backyards, is to take trees down um, that. Um, might pose a threat, but if they don't pose a threat and they're, they're simply dead and maybe you're thinking is an eyesore, know that that can be really valuable habitat to a woodpecker. And who knows, after the woodpecker uses it, you might get a um, an owl nesting in that tree in subsequent years or a family of flying squirrels using that hole. So it's going to be a really important resource. Um, yeah, Lisa suggests educating other people who think that woodpeckers are ruining trees. Um, it can be really frustrating when you have an animal that's not doing something you want it to do. Um, and I've had people say, oh, this beautiful tree in my front yard, um, the woodpeckers are killing it. Um, and uh, the case I can think about is this um, pileated woodpecker, people coming in, they had these huge pictures of huge gouges on the side of this tree. And they're saying, the woodpeckers are killing this tree. And I said, well, the woodpeckers are drilling into this tree because it has some sort of infestation. They wouldn't be doing this just for fun. It's not trying to make a nest. It knows that there is food in there. It knows that there are some sort of beetle larvae living in there or carpenter ants. So chances are this tree is either dead or dying to begin with. But now, instead of just having a dead tree, you have a dead tree that's becoming a banquet. So rather than getting frustrated with the woodpecker, know that this tree was going to die anyways, likely. And now you have a period of time where you get to really enjoy um, watching this woodpecker do its, do its work, which is not an opportunity you would have that close up. Um, a great suggestion to stop using pesticides and herbicides too on lawns. Yeah, particularly for birds like northern flicker that spend a lot of time foraging on the ground. Um, you know, people don't want ants in their house. Um, and so, you know, killing the ants that are outside can maybe deter from getting ants in your house, but it's also killing that food resource for northern flickers. Um, I've had families of flickers um, in the summer come to my backyard and forage on the ground and it is so much fun to watch these young flickers figure out how to get food and kind of play and um, it could be really treat to enjoy the different behaviors of woodpeckers. Um, another suggestion I'm seeing backyard suet, yeah. Um, these birds have to make it through sometimes a tough winter. I mean we've had extreme cold this winter We've now had some pretty heavy snowfalls this winter. So particularly um, as our climate becomes more variable, yes, we're warming, but we're also getting some extreme variability in our weather. Um, that's really hard for woodpeckers to go from like 40 degrees and no snow to overnight 30 below and you know 12 inches of snow. So providing them a resource, so bird feed, um, some great suggestions that folks have here. Suet, um, suet is great fat protein, um, really getting calories during a time when it's cold. Woodpeckers love suet. Um, peanuts in the shell in a wired cage is another great suggestion that um, woodpeckers really like. And those are all things that I sort of had on here too. If you're interested in um, really learning about one specific species that needs a lot of help right now, the red cockaded woodpecker, um, the Nature Conservancy is actually working a lot with that species, has protected habitat and is doing a lot to um, improve that habitat and protect that species. So um, if, you, if you're really wanting to, to learn more and make a contribution, 
um, to a species that truly needs help, um, go on to the Nature Conservancy's website, look up red cockaded woodpecker and, and see how you can help. Um, and so with that, I'll sort of take questions. Um, and um, people are asking for my contact information, which I didn't even think about because before when I worked at the Nature Center and did this for a living, like I always assumed people were gonna ask me stuff, but um, so now I'm not used to that, but um, I can certainly put it in the chat. Um, I'm gonna take questions now. I wish we had a way for people to unmute themselves and ask questions, but I'll just keep an eye on the chat. Um, so before we, you know, I'll sort of end this before we move into a chat um, discussion um, and say thank you all for joining. It was a pleasure to get to talk about birds with like a hundred people um, and to get to share about some birds that are pretty meaningful for me and I think can be really meaningful for you too. I hope this inspires you to get out and look for woodpeckers now when they're they're drumming and they're active and um, really get to know the species maybe you didn't know so well in your backyard. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to Green Mountain Audubon for having me. And um, I'll scroll through this chat and I'm willing to talk about birds for like ever. So, um, Zach, I'd like to uh, just break in before you do that. And yeah. I'm going to have the program committee and the rest of the board of the Green Mountain Audubon Society. Thank you. This was an outstanding talk. It was full of information, it was full of insights, it was full of some humor. Um, I think it was a, a superlative presentation. So we oh, thank, thank you, Tom. I really, I really appreciate that. It has been a lot of fun. You know, whenever I do a, a presentation, um, I learn a lot, you know. Um, I knew a lot about woodpeckers beforehand, but it prompted me to, to actually dig into the research I love. I'm again, a science nerd. So I go right to the literature. I am looking in um, research studies that folks have done about woodpeckers. Everything from, you know, genetic variation to, um, you know, groups, teams of engineers studying the biomechanics of woodpecker brains. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for me to expand my knowledge and I'm glad to get to share that with everyone. So I'm going to look at the, what is the best time to photograph woodpecker babies? Are they more active in mornings or evenings? Um, uh, so I, one of my favorite things is finding woodpecker nests. Um, well, the nestlings are still there. And it's actually not as hard as you'd think. Um, when the nestlings are getting close to fledging, like within the week or a few days before they're going to leave the nest, they are very vocal. I mean, you can walk through the forest and be, you know, 20 yards away from a nest and hear, hear, hear this kind of loud, insistent, uh, high-pitched chirping sound coming from multiple nestlings. And if you can track that down, maybe by, by then noticing an adult coming to feed, um, by that time in their nestling development, both parents are likely feeding them. So they're getting food pretty regularly. Um, so if you can follow that, um, I did this um, when I lived along the Winooski River in Waterbury, I found a hairy woodpecker nest and then I went there every day, sometimes a couple times of the day in the morning and the evening and kind of watched and got to be there when the young were fledging because I was tracking this nest. And so not only did I get really interesting images of the hairy woodpecker parents um, bringing food, the babies sticking their heads out of the hole, the male carrying fecal sacs out to clean the nest, um, but also getting to see the, the young woodpeckers. And it's kind of hilarious because they instinctually know how to climb and how to fly, but it does take a little bit of learning that's, that's quite comical. So that's my my recommendation for finding woodpecker babies. If you can find a nest and stick with it. Um, and downy, hairy woodpeckers um, are, are common enough that most good sized patches of forest are gonna have a woodpecker nesting in it. Um, so not far from your home, I'm sure with some effort in May and June and maybe even early July, um, you can find a nest. 
um, looking through um, our specific habitats being targeted for preservation. Um, yeah, so um, different species have different needs. Obviously, species like red-bellied woodpeckers that are generalists can get by in, a, in different forest types. Um, it can eat different foods. Um, their conservation needs are a little uh, a little less specific than a bird like the red cockaded woodpecker that needs a specific type of forest and a you know and a specific food source. So in Vermont, the species that really needs um, habitat is the blackback woodpecker and the three-toed woodpecker. Those are boreal birds. Um, quite frankly, Vermont is is at risk of losing losing its boreal forest. We've only had a little bit of it in the Northeast Kingdom and to some extent at higher elevations in the Green Mountains. But as climate change warms, those, those plants that, that really are, are the foundation of that community um, won't survive. So um, that's the big one, protecting those forests um, for those woodpeckers. I'm glad that someone is um, some people are excited to get out and photograph um, woodpeckers. Um, unfortunately, yeah, because they are so often coming to bird feeders, um, window strikes happen um, and, you know, it is often fatal for birds. So one really good suggestion is um, to um, put up some either decals and windows um, I've heard soap, like rubbing soap on the outside of the window, something to break up um, the glass. Birds really struggle with glass. Um, and so uh, they, um, they aren't able to recognize um, when they're flying directly at it until it's often too late. And um, so uh, that's one way you can sort of protect um, the birds. I'm just kind of scrolling back through the chat. Um, I don't know. Ellie George asked about spongy moth caterpillars. I don't know um, if any woodpecker woodpecker species eat that um, specific caterpillar, but they definitely like caterpillars. Um, and you know, we think of woodpeckers as like drilling into trees to find larvae. Oftentimes, that's many species are doing, but as they're climbing the tree, they're looking for food. So underneath bark, if there's a spider, if there's a caterpillar climbing on the tree, they'll grab that too. They're not, and you know, for the most part, exclusively looking for um, larva. Um, Zach, I'm, I'm sorry to do this. I really am sorry to do this, but we are approaching the, the two hour mark. Um, and we have about 42 people with us. So would it be possible to uh, perhaps choose the one or two last uh, comments and wrap it up, please? Yeah, um, I think I think that's all from what I'm reading. I think that's all I have for, um, for questions. So again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope you all get out um, and enjoy woodpeckers. And uh, if you get some really good photos, um, send them to the Audubon folks at Green Mountain Audubon and uh, they can send them to me or if you have further questions, um, you know, for me specifically, if you get a hold of the Audubon coordinators for tonight, um, they'll, they'll uh, share my contact information. So um, thank you all. And Zach, uh, I, join, I join everybody who benefited from your enthusiasm and your knowledge and you are a natural teacher. Uh, good luck in your future, wherever it takes you to see the woodpeckers everywhere. And uh, come back home sometime and uh, please uh, give us another presentation. So with that, everybody, we thank you and we wish you a good and pleasant evening and look out your windows and put your ears on and let's have some woodpecker sightings and hearings. Thank you, everybody. Good night.